a lot of um, <coughs> a lot of thinking um, in um, uh, in Europe has been shifting over the last couple of years, and I think <coughs> uh, I mean this is a European perspective. It has been shifting with Europe being do, doing its next five-year plan or whatever seven-year plan it is, because <coughs> um, Europe unfortunately also has those grand schemes that never work. Um, in the early 2000s, um, we had the Lisbon strategy and we thought one day we would be the most competitive economy in the world, oh God. Um, and it was it's still inside there a little hint on sustainability and stuff like that. Um, since a few years, um, we have a plan that's called Horizon 2020. How ambitious is that? And with what I heard about where our, how far our horizon seems to be, 2020 seems to be the limit. Um, but there is something in there that is interesting, uh, which is responsible research and innovation, uh, which um, <coughs> I, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about. Um, and <coughs> we need to differentiate two types of responsibility, I think. Uh, there is the responsibility um, to actually use or further develop or perfect the product, and we know that, and there's nothing new about that. And the example that I'll use is... Um, uh, nuclear weapons uh, pro proliferation or non-proliferation actually, um, where we think that some people just can't take on the responsibility to use certain technologies. It's something that we know since World War II or not far from there. Um, and then there is um, another type of responsibility, which is the stuff we should just not invent or which should not get to research or innovate it. Uh, because they should not be brought to market altogether because um, we, they, we consider they are dangerous. But strangely enough, the question then is who considers that they are dangerous? And the political and the scientific thinking obviously uh, are not always agreeing on that. And there's many uh, examples of that. And one very uh, typical example in Europe is the whole debate and, and, and the scientific literature and stance and the political stance around genetically modified crops, for example. Um, but what do we want to avoid when we're, when we're talking about it? Um, there, there is a lot of uh, innovation which is disturbing uh, these days. Um, one of them is what we in Europe call the fait accompli. Yes? Uh, you would say in the US it's better to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. And a lot, of that is, a lot of that is happening in all sorts of areas, but the two examples that I've taken here uh, are actually... Uh, in, the social, in the social media space. Uh, there are uh, Airbnb, uh, which, is, um, <clears throat> uh, which actually did exactly that and is now fighting with um, uh, legislation and government uh, in many places, not only in North America, also in Europe and in other places. Um, <clears throat> because they hurt law, they hurt current practices, they hurt the social status quo. Um, Uber is another example, um, but there are examples uh, in Airbnb is, um, <clears throat> uh, is a way to sell uh, your empty bed or room or whatever that you have, uh, like a bed and breakfast, um, and Airbnb, just for information, sells more beds than the top 10 in the hotel industry combined today. Uh, it's, I'm sorry? without paying taxes, which is rather annoying for certain, but not, but not for the property owners. And Uber, for those that don't know Uber, um, is um, a system that is an alternative to the traditional cab fare or taxi fare. And you have an app and you just call for a car and you can get a car. It doesn't exist in every city in the world, but it exists in Brussels where I live. Um, and um, for a reason I don't understand, the traditional taxi industry is not happy with it. Um, <laughs> There is, the, there is the, what I would call naive innovation. Um, and there's actually a lot of that. There's a lot of innovation which does not take a 360 degree view of the world. Um, <clears throat> I've seen um, uh, developments, uh, again, I'm taking European examples, but I'm sure the same exists uh, in, in North America. I'm seeing developments in all sorts of industries, uh, and for example, in healthcare, uh, which, um, which go pretty far, which have millions invested, and uh, which then run uh, against things like um, uh, the, the protection of private data and similar laws and things like that. And you just don't understand that those things were not taken into account earlier on in the process. And you think that, yeah, this, those people had a great idea, um, <clears throat> uh, but somehow uh, they have not taken all the measures and whatever to make sure that their great idea would be brought to fruition. 
um, there is um, <coughs> uh, there is innovation is based on the wrong incentives. Um, and the example I take there is um, government-led innovation, but it doesn't all have to be uh, like that. And it can lead to the good stuff and it can lead to the bad stuff. Um, it leads uh, to innovation in the areas of weaponry and security and people standing like that now whenever they have to take a plane and other things like that. But of course it also leads to food safety and um, it leads to uh, cars in Europe having much lower carbon emissions on average than cars in North America and things like that. So it's not only bad, but it's interesting to see that um, uh, certainly in certain parts of the world, and I think not only in Europe, also in Asia, uh, the government incentive uh, is playing an important role in innovation. Uh, unfortunately, when the government incentive is disproportionate, um, then it's going to lead to disproportionate solutions and therefore sometimes irresponsible solutions. Um, and then there is something we know for hundreds of years, um, sometimes in innovation we're just playing with fire because we're playing with technologies that we don't understand. And the examples are in Marie Curie uh, getting sick of her own x-rays, uh, in nuclear things that we don't master, uh, in um, a, a, a product we've all been using for uh, decades, asbestos, uh, which is now costing us uh, fortunes and an estimated half a million deaths in Europe uh, if we would all accumulate it, uh, and so forth and so forth, and which basically calls for a precautionary principle. So one way to look at this is to say, well, <clears throat> we live in a free market economy. I mean, no French socialists here, so uh, rather a North American stance. Um, and, um, and we could just say there's a, 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 simple, a simple cycle. You can innovate stuff, but if it's not useful, it won't get adopted. So basically, uh, step one, innovation requires adoption. And adoption leads to democratization prices are going to go down, and when prices are going to go down, that's going to fuel competition. Other people are crying, going to try to do this, and competition is going to fuel innovation, and your cycle is basically round. And <clears throat> you could wonder, well, why don't we just let the market do things? Um, and I think there is more of a thinking like that in North America than there is in Europe, or maybe China, or India. Um, but the market is not as self-regulating as we would like it to be. Um, and Basically, when the market is more or so self-regulated, it still has to work within legal compliance. Uh, and the question is whether the legal compliance that we're providing currently is sufficient. And the banking industry could be a nice example that is probably not. Also, innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in society. Um, and basically, uh, there is an expectation from society, also pretty liberal, actually, that if we innovate, then we're going to create positive contributions to uh, GDP. We're actually going to create job growth. And society is willing to pay for that in some way or in another. And uh, the way it's paying for that is venture capital, other forms of funding, um, subsidized or private resources that it is uh, providing to innovation. And I don't know if there's more uh, government funding in, in Europe than in North America. There is a perception that there is more government funding uh, in, in Europe than in North America. But I think that that perception may actually be false. But there's a lot uh, both on both sides of, of, of the ocean. There's a lot of government money going to, uh, to innovation. Um, and <clears throat> the question is, uh, how do you decide whether the money is going to the right place? Um, because basically it's very difficult to predict the outcomes of innovation. It's um, <clears throat> very difficult to decide what resources to allocate to innovation and therefore it's much more difficult to predict if you're allocating the right resources to the right outcomes. But that's what our politicians would want. They would like to say, well, we're interested in this particular outcome, which is something to do with public health or something like that, and we're just going to allocate the right resources so that it's going to happen. But in between, there is something with a lot of uncertainty that they cannot control and that is difficult uh, to actually grasp. Um, outcome is not a function of intention. Yes, It's not because you want something good that you're going to get something good. Uh, it's an open and complex environment. Uh, one of the things that is often forgotten, I think, in many of the innovation projects that we work with and that we see with our client companies, is that uh, there's a large part of the ecosystem, there's many actors that are ignored, um, <clears throat> outcomes are unpredictable, um, and 
no one innovates in a vacuum anymore. No one innovates on its own. Uh, all innovation is nearly become open or collaborative in some way, which means that we use our collective intelligence, but we don't always use our collective responsibility. Um, the other thing is, it's very difficult to say like, oh, this is not an, this is not, doesn't seem to contribute to an internet outcome, so we're not gonna put our money in there. Because there's a lot of examples where the original innovation is not necessarily uh, being used for its original intent. Uh, the first example there, gaming tech supports remote healthcare, is actually the Microsoft Kinect. I don't think that Microsoft ever thought that when they developed Kinect, uh, it would be useful in healthcare, but currently it's actually being used as a platform uh, to support um, remote healthcare. Um, uh, healthcare on its side supports safety in the automotive sector, could give examples of that, and you could go on and on where um, uh, innovation is not necessarily being uh, used in the way that it was originally intended, and where the, the, the end outcome can be very, very positive, whilst the intermediate uh, might be, you know, doubtful, especially from the point of view of politicians. So outcome as a function of resources, as I said, is even much more difficult. But <clears throat> what are then those outcomes that we're, that we're aiming for? In Europe, that's the same probably as in North America. I don't know. But for politicians, that's the grand challenges. Uh, it's how are we going to live with uh, less with, with that limited petri dish that we talked about? How are we, we going to cope with an aging society? Uh, how are we going to cope with the results of climate change? Um, and so forth and so forth. So coming towards a definition, I don't think that uh, responsible research and innovation is new, um, but <clears throat> uh, today the definition that we go to in Europe is that uh, it has to be an inclusive process. It means broad stakeholder involvement, and for example, something that was very difficult in the past, uh, having a large petrochem or biochem or other companies talk with the NGOs. I'm referring again to the crop example, uh, the genetically modified crops. Um, <clears throat> where responsiveness and responsibility are both mutually exercised uh, and where we actually apply design thinking um, to, uh, with a focus on the ethical, uh, the sustainable and the soci socially desirable outcomes. Uh, if that's the definition, then the question is how do we make that def definition hard? And <clears throat> it means that there is a need for governance. Uh, in, within the European space, um, there is uh, basically a number of initiatives now uh, to look and to assess innovation efforts um, <clears throat> with, uh, with, these, with these focuses. I mean, we have to be proactively considering uh, the societal impacts that we really want. Uh, much of the innovation in Europe is not at all geared at those societal impacts today. Uh, much of the innovation funding goes to things like um, very broad general technology areas uh, such as biotechnology or things like that and not necessarily to any of the things that are directly related to the grand challenges. Um, <clears throat> there is really uh, much more examination needed of what are the intentions, what are the risks and the assumptions. Um, there's much more dialogue needed between the stakeholders. There's platforms that are being created actually to, to facilitate that dialogue. Um, and, and there is a political responsiveness needed uh, to understand um, that uh, efforts uh, and money and funding and resources need to be guided uh, because that's going to influence the innovation agenda. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things that I mentioned in there is assessments, uh, assessments of innovation projects as long as they're somehow, even is it partially funded by government are always possible. Uh, you can get audited, and I had it myself several times. Um, <clears throat> but the assessments are good at identifying issues. They're not necessarily very good at offering alternatives. Uh, so one of the thinkings, uh, actually by Alan Marie Forsberg from Arkhurst University, uh, I think that's in Norway or in Denmark, I'm not sure, uh, <clears throat> says, well, maybe we should ju just need as responsible assessments as uh, we aim for responsible innovation using the same principles, the same guidelines, uh, and the same ethics. The other thing is Europe is not alone. Uh, there is a, a project which is called JEST, uh, which, a which aims for Europe uh, to collaborate uh, with the rest of the world, unfortunately not with North America, don't ask me why, um, <clears throat> on uh, how we can... Uh, 
shared the same principles in responsible innovation. Um, currently, just is mostly with China and India, mostly with Asia. And uh, one of the interesting things is to realize that if you don't share the same value system, then it's very difficult uh, to share the same ideas on responsible innovation. Um, and I'm not going to go through the value systems, uh, but progress, affluence, and things like that are not certainly not the same uh, as um, uh, freedom of expression and solidarity, which are European values. Um, <clears throat> so it's difficult to find a common ground. It doesn't mean that there is no common ground. There is actually some, uh, and it's highlighted there. Uh, but it means that a common view on responsible innovation uh, is not something that is necessarily easily achievable. Uh, at a global at a global level. Uh, so, in conclusion, uh, and I'm using the words from uh, Roger Strand, which uh, works for the um, uh, EPNet project. Uh, EPNet is a project that is looking uh, at the number of assessments that have been made uh, of innovation projects in the framework of responsible innovation. Um, there is so much uncertainty and complexity which is inherent to what we do in research and innovation uh, that there can be no fix, yes? There's no technical or institutional solution that can guarantee that science and technology develops responsibly. That doesn't mean, however, that we don't have to work both, I think, on the private level and on the public level, on the government level, that uh, we're basically um, doing our risk assessments, putting a number of security or mechanisms in place, um, and that we're actually steering things in the right direction. Thank you. Yeah, I'd like to take your first example, uh, Jerry Yudelson, one of the upcoming speakers, Airbnb and Uber. Is that responsible innovation or not? From the government perspective, which is dominated by large current economic interests in all countries, it's not. Because I can't collect taxes, and those people might not have the right insurance. From a sustainability perspective, it is. Because we're all, all using already constructed buildings, we're using already constructed cars, we're getting more hours of use out of the cars and the buildings. The tax and insurance problems are easily solved. So the point here is that you cannot control or direct innovation, and that we should all be focused on disruptive innovations if you're really for sustainability and you really want to disrupt the existing system. We should be promoting disruptive innovations as fast as possible. And the governments will never do that. The tax system will never catch up. But those are easily solved problems. So from the European perspective, government should direct everything. And from the American perspective, individuals should direct everything. And those are core value differences that are never going to be bridged. So how do you deal with this? Okay. So to start, I think that your perspective on European and North American, and I worked on both sides of the world, is maybe a bit simplistic. But it is certainly true that if we put it like black and white, uh, that certainly is the general perception. Uh, the other thing, uh, I think it's important to understand that what we call responsible or not is always just a picture in the context of today. Um, and uh, um, much of the things that seem natural to us today were certainly considered uh, irresponsible not that long ago. Um, and the other thing I would like to say is that uh, we should not confuse responsibility and disruptiveness. It's not because you're disrupting the system that it's not responsible. Um, we have, and, and that's where I think that um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very difficult, uh, it's a very difficult take on um, how we look at things because often when we disrupt the existing social, political, economical, or whatever situation, it's going to be considered by some yes, as non-responsible. Uh, but I don't think that's what it is about. I think, that, I think that it's about looking at what our grand challenges are and looking at responsibility from that point. Of view. <coughs> Chris, can you put up the four square yellow uh, thing that you opened up in that fait accompli on the upper left hand side? Um, yeah. Uh, I thought that was at uh, this, this one? one? Yeah, aside from the 
Brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Um, aside from the fact that we can't read it um, because it's yellow, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it, it, it is a brilliant observation. Um, to your point, I don't think that fait accompli is necessarily something that we need to uh, avoid in those contexts. I think that there is a, there is a um, <clears throat> let's just say a gradation here where <clears throat> dealing with ignorance is probably uh, the most challenging. Dealing with wrong incentives and being naive I think are, are the next level, and fait accompli often is things that we need to adjust to, and we just aren't, aren't ready for. But the, the, the larger picture here is essentially what you've done with this chart is to make a case for government, for, gov what? for, for government, government. And, and governance. Now, in uh, one of your slides, you talk uh, about the free market. Uh, and free market forces. The one thing that really does not count in uh, the free market system are the indirect impacts uh, that can't have a cost or a price attached to it. And again, you're making a case for government. And how we deal with government in the US and how government in the rest of the world uh, deals with government and thinks about it is very, very different. Uh, the other piece that I wanted to bring up is, uh, if you go back, is the tragedy of the commons. Um, and that is, actually there, there, there are two points. Uh, one is on the tragedy of the commons, there are innovations that will happen and we want them to happen and we need to invest in the infrastructure, but nobody wants to spend their money, somebody let somebody else do it. The other side of this though, when we have a European system and a US system, and if we just leave it at that on a global basis for, for right now. Um, there are certain innovations that are going to happen whether you want to control them or not because they provide enough incentive to small people, uh, to small groups of people who may or may not care about governance and care about these issues. Frank, so the question example. is, if you are a Europe and you care about responsible innovation, how do you manage this in a, a world context where these innovations are going to happen outside of your zone uh, and that you need to, that you will be affected by? I think fracking is a good example. Um, yeah. <clears throat> it's, uh, uh, it's, it's considered not acceptable in Europe. It's become standard practice in North America. Um, it's uh, there's good fracking and bad fracking, too. Of course. Or, of course. We, or there's, there's worse fracking and less worse fracking, of course. depending yes. on your point uh, of view. Again, nothing of what I'm saying is like black and white. It's difficult. But uh, what, is inter what is interesting is that um, beyond, beyond potentially solving an issue and creating a problem, um, it, is, uh, it, it is changing not only the North American, but the worldwide economics uh, of energy. Uh, because it is create, changing the worldwide economics of energy, and, Adrian was um, <clears throat> was talking about our dependency on, unfortunately, the Russian gas. Uh, <clears throat> it is it is not something that we can ignore in Europe, but at the same time, uh, it's largely considered uh, irresponsible and therefore impossible. Uh, and by the way, for for other reasons also, in a very in a very densely populated Europe, uh, <clears throat> where it would actually be much more um, annoying. <laughs> technology to be used. Uh, one of the uh, uh, looking for one there. of the reasons we study <laughs> systems of systems is so that we understand how things impact uh, other things. And that the the great philosopher uh, um, wrote a a book which really explains how when we solve one problem we create. And this was the great Dr. Seuss in the in, in his uh, thesis, The Cat in the Hat, um, where. Every time he solved one problem, he created another problem until he made the magic wand and uh, Cat C came out of that. Yeah, but the, the bottom line is when we solve problems without understanding the systems of systems, we, and, and, and without paying attention to the things that we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> but we do that all the time. And, yes. And, and, and so how do we develop and, a And on top of that, we do it in a local way. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I agree with, uh, what was your name, Jerry? Jerry. Jerry, I agree with Jerry. And I think, I think it philosophically boils down to uh, the assessment of progress. Innovation is normally associated with progress in some way. So the question then comes, I think, in general, when you have progress, either on a technological front or social front or any front, how do you adjudicate whether that progress is truly progressing as opposed to going backwards? In other words, is it a good progress? And I think in Europe, that has over, especially since World War II, that has devolved or evolved into making that decision based upon government experts. And I think the key word that you had there in one of your slides talked about desire or desired outcomes or desirous. So, desire there you go. And, and I think everything boils down to desire. Who defines what is desirable? And I think in the United States, I agree with Jerry, that decision for good or for ill has over the de decades and centuries of our culture, we've decided to let the public, i.e. the marketplace, make a decision on whether that is, is good or not. In Europe, they've decided for good or for ill um, to let government do that. And I think a very, a, a, a very um, telling example of that is one of the key differences between the European Commission in looking at M&A, in other words, acquisitions, or in the United States, there are many common denominators. In other words, there are green flags that the Commission looks at in the United States in looking at an acquisition to say, yeah, that's a good idea. And there are many red flags. And there are many common between Europe and the United States. But one glaring difference, and I experienced this firsthand during the acquisition of, by GE of Honeywell, both huge multinational corporations. And after the, at the end of the day, the United States uh, commissions on trade basically said, yeah, that's going to be good for the, for the customer. The end buyer of these products that Honeywell and GE make, at the end of the day, are going to be good for the, for the marketplace. The consumers, the buyers, will, then be, will profit from this. The European Commission, on the other hand, said, nope, this is not a good idea. Why? Because it will disrupt the existing businesses in place. Our job is to protect them. The United States said we want to protect the consumer. And I think therein lies that philosophical difference between the two, why we do frack, and we will continue to frack, and why France will not, even though the highest content of global shale gas is trapped under France. I, I think, by the way, that we should probably redefine progress our definition of progress at some stage. I think that we should think very critically about the notion of governance versus the notion of government. Uh, there's no doubt but what a certain amount of governance is necessary in any system in order to keep it from running away or oscillating or whatever. But the form of that governance when instantiated in systems run by the same kind of human beings that are greedy and cheating, etc. The reason we need governance over here says that if you're not careful, you will create a monster called government, which is not responsible to anything but itself. So let's think clearly about the notion of governance versus how we implement governance and how we make government responsible to whoever is the consumer or whatever party you want it to be responsible for. Peter. So maybe just and another this. perspective on this. Is that in, in nature, um, nature gets to decide you know, what innovations don't work. You have a new gene that comes in the genome. And nature says, man, that's a great idea. Or it says, sorry, you just had a Darwin moment, and, and away you go. <laughs> when in, in culture, um, the question is, who gets to kill innovations? And um, in, a, in a true free market, customers get to kill innovations. Um, but what happens in a lot of free markets is that the incumbents, whether it's a king, whether it's the oil industry, whether it's the finance industry, taxes. they get to kill innovations. 
And, and so the role of a government is basically, what was interesting in your, in your Venn diagram of the things that India, China, and Europe agreed on was justice. And the idea of justice is that uh, it's not just the powerful that get to kill innovations. It, it's somehow more broadly distributed amongst all of us. So I, I think there's, that's just kind of another, you know, if you look at the U.S., we have this wonderful, like in the computer industry, we have a free market. In the medical industry, about 40% of our dollars are siphoned off to incumbents who don't really add to health care. So there's, I, I think there, you know, instead of this divide between Europe and the U.S., there's really this common feeling of, yes, we want market-driven innovation, and we want justice. We want to sit, we want to create an ecostructure, an infrastructure, whatever, where you don't kill off stuff just because it's inconvenient to the king or the you know whoever whoever's there. So I have just another perspective. I would like to say something about our horizon here and taking both your comments together in that. I think that the, the horizon of the marketplace is years at best. Um, the horizon, the horizon of some higher level government, I mean, average government is probably not more than four years or something like that, but some government plans are looking farther than that. But it's not much farther than 2020 or 2030. I think, I think that the horizon that we need for the kind of governance that we talked about is 50 years or something. 